Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Explore at Home, the Great Exhibition Road Festival's online event series. Uh, my name's James. I'm from Imperial College London. I'll be your host for this lunchtime discussion. Uh, with Explore at Home, we've been exploring projects, stories, individuals who bring together or blur the boundaries between art and science, nature and technology, innovation and cultural heritage. And in a way, there's, I guess there's there's few more example, few, few more famous examples of this in popular culture, certainly in ch children's literature than Alice in Wonderland. Uh, mathematical concepts of, sort of space, time, logic, scale, they run throughout Lewis Carroll's famous creation. From the geometry of Alice's walk through that shrinking corridor or her tumble through the rabbit hole into a new universe, the book can, can be seen, I guess, as an ode to Carroll's love of maths, logic and the abstraction of reality. As well as you know, fascinating us at the Great Exhibition Road Festival, these themes are also explored in the V&A's new exhibition, Alice Curiouser and Curiouser. So whether you've managed to visit the exhibition or are thinking of going, uh, we thought it was a great time to journey down the rabbit hole ourselves. To do so, I'm delighted to be joined by two speakers from either side of the looking glass, certainly either side of Exhibition Road. Uh, I've got Kate Bailey, who is a uh, curator at the V&A and who's been working very hard on this exhibition. Uh, she'll be sh shortly taking us on a whistle stop tour of some of our favourite parts and joining us to explore some of the sort of mathematical themes and and uh, physics that, uh, that permeates the book. We've got a black hole physicist here at Imperial, Professor Toby Wiseman. Toby, uh, you recently read the story to your own children, um, uh, so you maybe had an opportunity to reflect on some of the concepts. How did the, certainly what did, the, what did your children think of it when you, when you read it to them? They liked it, they liked it. I think it's a book that uh, at the right age they love. If, if they're too young, they, they don't get it. And then when they're too old, they're interested in other things. But my youngest is about uh, eight at the moment, and she's she really enjoyed it. Yeah, loved it. Brilliant. So uh, before we get started, um, before I hand over to Kate, I'd just like to remind everyone that today is an interactive discussion, uh, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, your comments, your questions. Uh, just write it in the YouTube chat, uh, which is, I think, to the right of the stream. Uh, and I've got my colleague Mimi. She's there. She's talk talking away to you guys, so she can pass them on to me, uh, and I'll ask them to either Toby or Kate, uh, or, maybe, or maybe both. So uh, we would just ask for everyone if you could be considerate when you are posting. We don't want to say anything that disrupts the experience for other people. Right. If that's all understood by everyone. Uh, yep. Let's get started by handing over to you, Kate, to take us on a tour of the of an exhibition that The Guardian gave a five star review to and called A Wonderful Tumble Down the Rabbit Hole. There you go. Uh, take it away, Kate. I'll bring your slides up on the screen and you can give us a little taster of what's in store. Thank you, James, and uh, good good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to whiz you through um, Alice Curiouser and Curiouser. Um, as James said, it's at the V&A at the moment until till December, but I shall give you a sneak um, preview into the exhibition itself and to some of the thinking behind it before we get into our really interesting conversation. So the v &A and Alice, we have the same timeline, uh, 150 years of creativity. You can find Alice through the v &A collections. The books are a kind of fascinating exploration of learning and curiosity. They work for adults and children. And what fascinated me from the outset was the relationship um, of science and art and the powerful concepts within the book. So the book, the exhibition really examines um, the cultural phenomenon of Alice and looking and thinking about how and why the books have been translated into 170 languages, uh, the impact and influence of the books across disciplines. Um, and what we've done with the exhibition is really to sort of borrow from the text this idea of curiouser and curiouser and imagine the impossible and um, to create an exhibition which um, shows you a journey through the books themselves so you follow through chapters of the book but also looks at the uh over 150 years of how the books have uh inspired various different imaginings um from literature to performance from film to video games from music to theater um so we interrogate the why alice and what are those themes that uh really do um inspire and permeate and resonate with our collective consciousness um so big ideas of space, time and scale. Um, this is something that uh, I, it, I 
I started from developing a sort of immersive theatrical exhibition that moves through time, moves through space and is an exploration of scale, thinking very much about the ideas in the books to do with dimensions and portals, that sense of falling down the rabbit hole or stepping through the looking glass in the second book. At, um, so Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. The looking glass, that idea of stepping through a mirror to the world on the other side. It's a, obviously a joy for a, a curator and a joy for an exhibition designer. So the exhibition vision takes you through um, this structure. So we move from the idea of creating Alice through filming, reimagining, staging and being and all the time thinking of these really big themes um, that really resonate with people that kind of return to the text and use it as an exploration of from the artistic to the scientific imagination. Uh, so it begins with a sort of the world of Christchurch, the sense of um, the Victorian wonderland, looking at those big themes from the time, uh, an exploration into the sort of work of um, Charles Dodgson, Lewis Carroll, looking at his games of logic, looking at fallacies, looking at his mathematical studies. Um, so the, the spaces at the v &A are very theatrical, this space inspired by Oxford, inspired by Christchurch. We take you through a rabbit hole, through a hallway of doors, playing with scale, playing with perspective. Um, we, we look at some of our objects like the um, wonderful magic lantern slides and have animated those using science and technology to kind of lift the objects into a, into a new sort of space and and and. and um, and design. Uh, we have a whole section that's at the filming of Alice and how the books have kind of really inspired film directors since 1903, uh, looking at how the media, how the subject uh, really lends itself from sort of uh, black and white movies right up to sort of CGI and how internationally, globally, the subject really resonates. Um, we have uh, uh, journeys through the pool of tears um, where you can feel like you're sort of drowning in Alice's tears, looking up through portals into space. Uh, there's a sense of reimagining. This moment is like in the exhibition, a hundred years since the uh, books were written, looking at why the Alice books in the 60s really resonated with um, artists, thinkers, writers, the counterculture movement, looking at ideas of perception and space, um, playing with tea parties. We have a section that looks at staging Alice, so uh, why the books lend themselves, the metaphor of the books for the political stage. Also, we have a presentation here which is in VR, so it really does allow you to kind of shrink and go rab down rabbit holes and play a game of fl flamingo croquet. Um, the whole staging Alice, how it's been adapted across theatre. And then our final section really looks at sort of the being Alice. So what I did here was to kind of think about why the books are relevant in the 21st century. Think about them across all different kinds of discipline, from fashion to photography, um, but also thinking about this scientific imagination and some of those big ideas and concepts in the book that um, the book allows us to, to connect to. So whether that's the um, Alice experiment at CERN um, or uh, a wonderful dress like Iris Van Herpen's Infinity Dress, which allows us to think about space and motion and time through this uh, um, dress with a, a wonderful uh, sculpture by Anthony Howe. And the final of the exhibition takes you literally through the looking glass and we return to the text and we return, return to a sort of mirrored room which allows allows the visitor to kind of contemplate the text, contemplate the words of the book and really sort of think about sort of ideas of curiosity, contemporary curiosity, imagining wonderlands and really that idea of, you know, what, what's, what's happening on the other side of, of the mirror. Uh, so that was a quick canter through the exhibition. I'll hand back to James. Brilliant. That's, uh, thanks so much for that, Kate. That was great. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, me and Toby were lucky to be invited to sort of have a look at uh, look, look, look at the exhibition. And uh, yeah, from personal perspective, I thought it was brilliant. So if, any, yeah, if anyone at home hasn't had a chance yet, please do. I think we're going to post some links into the chat onto the VNA website where you can find out a little bit more and even look at booking a place onto it. But yeah, it, it, it was really great. Um, I guess where I wanted to start, I guess, was to look at uh, from a, a it seems that and this is sort of picked up a little bit in the exhibition that uh, it's in a book that seems to appeal to people with a sort of scientific mathematical mind. Uh, I don't know. I know that I'm going to come to you in a second, Kate, because I know you spoke to lots of sort of scientists and uh, maybe you could talk about whether you felt that or there were, whether there were any fans amongst the people you spoke to in terms of researching uh, the exhibition. But maybe Toby first. What, what, why do you think it's sort of 
at various points seems to appeal to people with a sort of a, of a mathematical or physics persuasion? Well, I think, um, I mean, firstly, I think it appeals to children of a certain age, mm. uh, whether they grow up to be physicists or mathematicians or not. Uh, I think, you know, all, all children are fundamentally little scientists and uh, are fundamentally curious. It's something about human nature and whether that persists into adulthood is a sort of a, a different story. But um, but really, a scientist in some sense is just someone who never really gave up that slightly childlike curiosity about some subject. Um, so perhaps they never fully grew up, you might say. <laughs> My wife would probably agree with me there, I think. Um, uh, so I think it really appealed, you know, it, it's all about curiosity. Alice is a little, uh, one way to read it, of course, is Alice is a little scientist in this incredible uh, alien world trying to make sense of it. And and what what she thinks should be true isn't true. And she comes to terms with interacting with that and making a sort of model of it, dealing with it. And that's what we do as scientists. So I think it's that process, the curiosity is very appealing. And I think particularly for children, um, you know, who are naturally curious, ideas of what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, it's fundamental to understanding. Is that, yeah, to come to you, Kate, in terms of your, some of your interactions with some of the researchers and scientists and physicists you spoke to, uh, I know you, you you spoke to some of the people from CERN as well, like, did you, did, did they come across as Alice fans? Was it a book that was important to them? Yeah, um, I mean, it's uh, obviously it's a, a big journey kind of creating a show like this. And so there are um, conversations I had with um, uh, mathematicians who were deeply inspired by the book, who are also sort of really a, a sort of Lewis Carroll um, obsessives like Edward Wakeling. And there's a, a fantastic book by Robin Wilson that looks at the sort of mathematical world of Charles Dodgson. So these books and also the amazing annotated version by Martin Gardner, all of these books really kind of have looked at this idea. Um, and then actually to kind of take that and to kind of look um, um, as a curator at the the works, not just in the V&A collection, but the works that had had used the books to 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 inspire sort of moving on maybe new scientific and technological ideas, like from video games to sort of CGI film, but then actually coming into the contemporary world and looking at going to CERN, having that opportunity to go with Marila Neudecker, um, who's a, an artist in residence at CERN, to go there and to kind of go be with the physicist and talk about exactly what Toby is saying, that sense of the, the books um, having these really bold um, I ideas from physics that really do have a kind of contemporary curiosity. And um, I think there's a perception that often in the world of the arts that the arts are creative, but actually the scientists are far more <laughs> creative. And what's also extraordinary about CERN is that you, you do go 50 meters underground. You are in a sort of tunnel with rabbit holes. So the whole kind of concept of it and the sense of scale at CERN is, is mind blowing, isn't it? With the experiment through the enormous magnet. So, so yes, um, CERN was inspiring as, as were so many people before that have really interrogated maths in the books and that um i guess it, it's not completely surprising that 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 there's that em there's that emphasis or that theme in the vna's exploration of alice uh sort of the, the mathematical and scientific blurring th those boundaries with the sort of arts and creative is it's sort of fundamental to the vna itself so when they i guess a vna look at uh alice uh, was always going to bring out those elements. W was that sort of mathematical and scientific elements of the story, were they there from the very con like concepts of, of doing this exhibition in the first place? Um, I think there are so many different ways we could have taken the mm -hmm. exhibition. Uh, I mean, Alice through film, Alice through theatre, we did try to kind of reflect across the, the collections. So Alice is one of those subjects that is... Um, is, is found across from sort of the Asia collections through to photography. Um, but actually the philosophy and looking at the kind of context and the history of the v and I think that was something that really um, inspired me. So the books, um, the story was first told in 1862. The V&A, as, as uh, you know, was set up as the South Kensington Museum in 1857. And in 1857, it, it, there wasn't a separate science museum. The V&A was science and art. Um, and, and, and I think um, over time, we've, we often separate these things. So what really, really excited me was the opportunity to bring them back 
to, together in this way with this book, um, slightly coming from the nature of the objects that you kind of discover that that uh, that have explored the ideas, but also the fact that it sort of mirrors the V&A sort of history and, and, and founding principles. In terms of it, uh, in, let's maybe then go back in time a little bit and, and look at the world that um, Lewis Carroll sort of was in and was sort of, sort of inspired by, particularly the sort of world of sort of mathematics. Um, I don't care if you want to tell a bit of the biography about who he was hanging around in, the world he sort of immersed himself in that might have uh, reflected, have, there might be some sort of reflection of that in, in the piece, in the book that he produced. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I should say I'm not a mathematician. I'm a cur curator in the theatre and performance department at the V&A. But when I went to Christchurch to look at the um, objects uh, in, in the archive there that related to the books and related to Charles Dodgson, um, Lewis Carroll's um, work within Christchurch. So he was a, he was a polymath, wasn't he? He was, a, he was studying mathematician, mathematics there. And he was publishing some quite interesting kind of scientific mathematical papers um, on algebra, on geometry. He was very much a Euclidean mathematician, I, as far as I understood. So it was fascinating to see these alongside early sketches that he was making of sort of Alice with her her neck sort of extending and sort of these crazy characters and to sort of this sort of sense of the mouse's tail on the page that the fact that all these things were happening at the same time I think that was super interesting but in terms of the maths I'll defer to Toby to explain in greater <laughs> depth. Well I mean yeah, Toby, yeah. What, what was happening in the world of maths at that, at that time conceptually or any particular breakthroughs that are sort of relevant you think to this? So I mean I think it was okay. So, so firstly, I mean, I think it's important to stress he was a very serious mathematician. Um, there's no, there's no. I mean, he has theorems named after him, and um, I mean, so he was an academic. He was a, an academic researcher in mathematics. He would have taught as well, but uh, but certainly created research that was of a high quality. Um, but that wasn't in the area of logic, which of course plays a big role in his book. But he will have been interested no doubt in the area of logic and particularly at that time um, logic was playing an increasingly sort of uh, interesting role in mathematics so it was a, it was a sort of period where um, uh, people uh, very formal mathematicians were trying to systematize mathematics and, and give it a rigorous underpinning and so over the sort of course of the 1800s there was a movement to make uh, use ideas from logic uh, and abstraction to make ideas like numbers completely logically rigorous, like a, 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 the idea that there was a, some completely rigorous framework on which you built all of the rest of mathematics. And that was, a, that was an important theme. Now, I, I don't, he didn't work in that area, but certainly would have been exposed to it, possibly would have taught undergraduates on that sort of thing. You know, as, a, as an academic, you tend to teach a range of subjects, not just the thing that you're researching personally. Um, and, th and that was a, a very interesting uh, time. And in particular, led up towards the end of the century with very interesting ideas with, say, Bertrand Russell, where um, this sort of program of axiomatizing what things are and relations between things, the notion of what we call set theory, which really uh, underlies everything uh, to some extent was um, sort of blown apart by Bertrand Russell because you, you take these simple ideas in logic um, that you, you're, you're certain should exist and then you, you, you carry on to their logical extreme and then Bertrand Russell shows that you reach a paradox. And so actually you have to be very careful about what collections of things you're allowed to take. Uh, I, I suppose Kate is a curator. This is, it, it's actually only relevant if you've got infinitely many things. Uh, so you're probably okay, you don't have to worry about it. But, uh, but you know when so what what groups of objects are you allowed to talk about what what sort of relations between them are you allowed to have and these were very powerful ideas towards the end of the 1800s with big surprises that have had you know huge impact in sort of philosophy and mathematics um very, at a very formal level but certainly the ideas in logic would have been uh, you know were very interesting and lots of developments and these some of these very basic notions in in um, logic and also its use in language, linguistics, are, are, are obviously what's explored in the books in this brilliant way, you know, turning implications round. I think there's a phrase, I, I breathe, I sleep, 
I breathe when I sleep mm -hmm. and I sleep when I breathe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea that the implication only works one way is a sort of very basic idea. There are these two objects, sleeping and breathing, and an implication between them. And you have to understand what implication means, that it doesn't, it doesn't work both ways. And, and ideas about when things do imply both ways and when they don't are, are the very basics of sort of abstract mathematics and a very important idea. And I feel that he was sort of teaching this to people. He's teaching kids about these ideas and, and you know, in, in a very funny way. I was just um, uh, uh, picking up on that because obviously he devised a game of logic, didn't mm. he? So he actually had a, a game and we know from when he was a child, he was having um, playing with these games to do with ways and means. So he's always interested in the kind of gameplay. And I think one of the fascinating thing, things looking at the objects at Christchurch is that you can see um, the sort of fallacies through text and mm. wordplay alongside the mathematical equations. Mm. Um, and then when you sort of think about that with the ideas in the book, which you know, a sort of much more open ended, so that that there was a sort of logic and a and a sort of trying to find the answers through through the fallacies and the and the algebra and the equations, and then these ideas that come out of the book. Because um, one of the my favourite ones was, you know, all eggs can be cracked, some eggs are hard boiled, all wasps are uh, are unfriendly, all puppies are, are are friendly. And then when you kind of look at these with their sort of mathematical um, equations, it's fascinating. So I think that interest in sort of the mm -hmm. equations and and algorithms and storytelling really sort of um, puts you in the mind of Lewis Carroll, doesn't it? And clearly, and just enjoying language and what yes. you can do with language and how that fits around ideas and logic. He was obviously fascinated by language, uh, you know, his poetry and so on. He, yeah, he was, he, was a he was clearly a brilliant man who thought about many, many different things. I love those, yeah, yeah. fun, playful, examples of with you know puppies and broken eggs like th that idea of whether something can is true only if it can be if it's if it's true every single time or you and you it's impossible to find something if it's impossible to find the alternative is that that that's, that's such an interesting concept within sort of mathematics as well and it's just a really mm. fun way of exploring it we had a really nice comment from ewan who says i think the themes of exploration within the book are timeless it's not surprising it's still relevant now especially in science which i think that picks up on some of the things that you mentioned especially in alice being a little scientist as well uh toby <laughs> Uh, and then we had a question from Sheena, which I think is for you, Kate. Uh, yeah. Why did the story have a rabbit? Can it be can, can it be a dog or a cat? Uh, I guess rabbit holds. Or, uh, um, yeah. unless, unless Lewis Carroll had a particular fondness of rabbits that you've you discovered. I, I I think it's the the idea of the rabbit hole must have mm. you know, and and that's one of the wonderful things about the book is it encourages you to sort of think about the world differently, but but you also have that opportunity to be in the real world so Alice is on a riverbank the the white rabbit goes down a rabbit hole it triggers your imagination for what might be happening underneath the world um so there's always that sense that you're you're in reality but you're also in this sort of imaginary world so I think the rabbit hole was probably the the reason for the rabbit as opposed to a dog or a cat there is a cat in Looking Glass actually but it doesn't do anything very exciting although it does yeah maybe yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks so much for that, Sheena. That was uh, that was great. Yeah, if anyone else has any other thoughts or reflections on the book or questions they'd like to ask uh, Toby or Kate, just put them yeah put them in the chat and we can we can sort of read them out. Um, I wondered, Toby, sort of one uh, one concept that we discussed previously about that that time is you know there's this idea that m maybe previously or so uh, that maths can help us explain the world that we know or the world that's familiar and and give some sort of underpinning of of reality and then there's this sort of shift that maths can start to imagine possibilities that we've never experienced uh uh and 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 say that they that, you know they could exist and then certainly in in, in physics and uh, that's 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 kind of how a lot of physics discoveries are made nowadays and sort of carol's ability to sort of imagine future possibilities through logic i think is sort of there's a there's, there seems to be some sort of similarities there is that do you think that's sort of fair to say uh, no absolutely you know so I guess there was a, 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 a renaissance time at the time of Newton where there was this realization that objects could, their motion could be quantified by mathematics. Um, and Newton's laws were this sort of mathematical apparatus. I mean, he developed on the physical side, Newton's laws, and on the mathematical side, calculus, which is what the laws used, and showed everyone how 
Um, using this, you could predict the motions of objects and so on if you understood the forces acting on them. But there was another renaissance then, sort of later in the 1800s, um, where new physical laws were being developed. And, and at the time, in the sort of 1860s, Maxwell uh, wrote down what we call the Maxwell equations, which are the equations that govern electricity and magnetism. And that was a big, a big moment in sort of the development of our understanding of the world. So I think it's you know a very similar time to the the time Lewis Carroll's uh, or Dodgson was writing uh, Alice in Wonderland. And um, you know with things like Maxwell's equations, and also simultaneously there was in the 1800s a lot of mathematical development of the maths encapsulated in that sort of equation, what we call differential equations, wave equations, and so on. It all came together. Um, and Maxwell's equations really describe to an extremely uh, you know, accurate degree exactly how electricity and magnetism works. They're sort of, barring quantum mechanics that came later, they're the end of the story. And this is an incredibly profound thing because you can write them down as mathematical equations in a couple of lines. They're very simple. They're actually, I think, on Maxwell's, um, are they on his uh, gravestone? I can't remember. They're written up somewhere. You know, there's something you can etch in stone if you want to. Um, but this realization that, um, you know, nature could be encapsulated in mathematics, that was very much, I mean, it started with Newton, but it was developed very much around this period at the end of the 1800s. And, and so I think, you know, it fitted with this Victorian idea of trying to understand and dominate and control the world, this idea that actually there's something almost mechanical or, or, or like a sort of... Um, a clockwork thing, some mechanism behind what's going on. They 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 revealed this, and um, I think that was a it was a very powerful time. And from that, um, people like Einstein then realized there are all sorts of new physical laws. So Einstein's idea about the speed of light being fundamental uh, is encapsulated already in Maxwell's equations. So once you've seen Maxwell's equations, you see there's a funny structure there, and um, Coming from a Newtonian point of view, you don't understand that structure, but uh, the, the, the notion of the speed of light being fixed and absolute is there in Maxwell's equations if you can just understand it. And that's essentially what Einstein then later did, you know, 30, 40 years later. And so, you know, from that beginning point in mathematics, all sorts of new ideas that then were physically shown to be true came later. And so, yes, this idea that mathematics underpins our world for whatever reason, no one knows why. But the fact it does was sort of emerging and I think being taken very seriously from that point. Um, so very exciting and, and a sort of a paradigm shifting time in a way. Yeah, I think, I th I think the fact that you, know, you can use it once you understand that maths can be used to explain the world. And then if thing, it's, it, there's a shift there to if something works mathematically, it might it might be a reality or maybe not one that we can comprehend or see or, you know, we can't imagine the speed of light and think or the speed of light being in, uh, finite. But the maths told us it was or it told Einstein it was. Or, and and so and then and then you're sort of you're then starting to not just explain things that you encounter every day. You're starting to imagine uh, things beyond our comprehension, I guess. And that, that's this, or this, that, that's where I guess oh, I mean, there's an element of creativity to that. I'm not sure um but yeah uh, that, that's that's really that's really interesting um another uh, sort of concept that sort of links i think quite closely to in physics and uh, is sort of, sort of this, and and is sort of common throughout the book is is the idea of scale and play, and lewis carroll seems to play around a lot with scale uh kate uh, i think you might have mentioned it in your quick briefly on your overview yeah. maybe look at it in a little more detail about your use of sort of virtual reality to explore yeah. scale within the exhibition i thought that was a, a really interesting part a very popular part of the mm -hmm. exhibition yeah, no, it was it was a um, great opportunity actually to be able to work with VR to explore some of those ideas in the book that are slightly di more difficult to do in 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 real terms. So obviously within the exhibition design, we played with various things with scale, like large doorways and mushrooms and things. But the opportunity within a VR headset to take some of those ideas where Alice has agency, but also where she, where these kind of crazy things happen to her and almost kind of use the, the VR headset as a very much your sort of modern day looking glass um, just felt so right. Uh, so we um, worked with um, HTC and the Vive Cosmos headset 
to to explore these ideas so Alice shrinks and she grows and she goes down rabbit holes um, um, and also there's um, a fantastic moment in the book where she plays flamingo croquet now this was something that we were struggling to do in the exhibition itself but actually to be able to do that in the world of, of VR and it did feel like in terms of everything we're talking about with the sense of um, uh, Lewis Carroll being interested in, in 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 the maths and the and the visual storytelling that kind of gaming and VR felt like a natural fit for him like if perhaps if he was working in in 2021 this might be something he would be have been exploring um, that sense of algorithms that sense of playing with space I mean the, the VR space is obviously really really exciting kind of territory to kind of push 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 boundaries and push ideas from the book Right. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, in terms of scale with a physicist hat on, um, uh, Toby, it's, like, it's, it seems certainly in modern day physics, scale creates a little bit of a problem in terms of sort of this idea of the quantum world and the, the gravity dominated world. I don't know if you can talk about your experiences with scale or how scale influences your work or has, has influenced uh, physics in, in, in sort of the last century or so. Well, so, yeah, I mean, scale is um, scale is absolutely key to physics and it always has been um you know starting sort of way back the idea of physics is a sort of reductionist one where you have some probably co quite complicated system and you want to you're interested in some phenomena that happens on some scale and then the idea is that you write down a model that somehow describes that phenomena that you're interested in without describing all the other stuff that you're not interested in so you're picking out certain scales of interest and trying to describe that in as um, efficient a way as possible, a manageable and useful way as possible. Um, so that's always been there, but more recently ideas of scale have played a, a, an increasingly important role. With quantum mechanics, we have uh, you know very strange uh, behaviors that happen at small scales, and with gravitation, we have very different behaviors at large scale. And understanding how to connect these with a sort of single theory that clearly behaves very differently on different scales is one of the sort of modern challenges of, of physics. And it, in particle physics, there's a very interesting story with scale. So particle, the experiment that uh, Kate's talking about at, uh, at CERN, that, and this wonderful um, art artist has created a, a video about that's in the, um, the uh, exhibit, um, is called, it's the Alice experiment. And it's one of the experiments that collides uh, uh, irons together very, very, with huge energies, very hard to see what comes out. And th th what's one of the ironies of modern physics is that um, because of quantum mechanics, in order to probe smaller scales, you need bigger energies. So energy is inversely related to the scale you probe. So our biggest microscopes now uh, are the CERN colliders and they, they probe the smallest scales. They allow us to see these tiny structures. Um, but, but scale plays this critical role there. The theories that we that describe the sort of physics going on there um, were developed in the sort of 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and uh, are still to be fully understood uh, sort of at a, at a mathematical level. And one of the very interesting things is how these theories change as you change the scale at which you look at them. There's a concept called renormalization, which is that um, the theory, for example, that governs the nuclear physics that takes place when you smash ions together at this CERN experiment, that theory has is, is got a sort of cool name, quantum chromodynamics, but, uh, or the theory of the strong interactions. But it's a very, very beautiful theory. Uh, when you look at it at very high energies, it's a very simple theory of uh, particles called quarks, and they interact with each other in a very simple and sort of simple way they weakly interact they bounce off each other and do their thing but you can think of them as little particles but as you look at different scales at lower energies or bigger scales it turns out the the interaction it's the same theory but the interactions between those particles become stronger and stronger until you get down to sort of nuclear scales where actually the interactions become so strong that the physics looks completely different and so this is one of the wonderful themes that, that we're still trying to get to grips with that you may have a theory that in some at some scale looks very simple, but when you change scale, that same theory starts to look very complicated and, and can look very different. And so these ideas of how things look at changing scales is, is very much a theme in modern physics. So it's, it's very interesting to see 
all of these scale changes in Alice's books and the different things that happen at different scales and so on. And is that is that if 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 a theory sort of gets more complicated at different scales or or changes, is is that a, is that a weakness in the theory or is that something just a nature of reality we have to accept that things don't work differently? No, no, absolutely. Scales? So with the strong interactions uh, at, at high energies, it, it's a very simple theory. It looks like quarks that weakly interact with each other. And the beautiful thing about that is we can mathematically understand that easily because they're just some particles that interact weakly. And it's a theory you can write down on, you know, on a T-shirt, quite literally. It's, it's very simple to write down and understand. Oh, I say simple. I mean, it's relatively simple. Um, but uh, after quite a lot of years of study. But, uh, but when you start to look at it at low energies, as you, as you increase the scales you're looking at it, uh, and these things interact more strongly, it's still the same theory, but it becomes very difficult to calculate with because of this strong interaction between the particles. And actually what the theory looks like isn't quarks at all. We don't see quarks around us in nature. What we see is uh, you know, atoms with their nuclei made of neutrons and protons. So neutrons and protons are what quarks look like at low energies or big scales. And in fact, there's all sorts of other exotic particles that you don't see in nature, but you see in colliders. And so all of that really exotic stuff is coming out of a very simple theory. That's ha apparently how it is. You know, the maths is the maths. That's what it is. Uh, it makes our life hard if we want to calculate things when things become uh, sort of strongly interacting. And, 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 and in some ways, you could say the biggest challenge in modern physics is to deal with what we call strongly interacting theories. Uh, to be able to calculate with them. It's, it seems to be a very tough mathematical problem. But turning it round, gravity works interestingly the other way. So Einstein's theory of gravity, we can view as a theory of particles, gravitons, which are weakly interacting. They don't, you know, they, they travel around and, and, and bounce off each other weakly um, at low energies on big scales in our universe. So we think we understand that. But if we try and run the other way and go up to high energies or small scales, um, when quantum mechanics really starts to kick in, they get more and more, uh, they interact more and more strongly. And at some scale, which we call the Planck scale, um, that which is a tiny, tiny scale, it's sort of billions of billions of billions of billions of uh, meter, uh, those things start, the, the gravitons interact so strongly that we don't understand what happens there. We know that our description breaks down mm. and sort of the really big theme, if you like, in fundamental theoretical physics is to try and understand what happens to gravity at these tiny scales. Um, and and we, we haven't really done that yet. We don't really know. But it, it's a very uh, it's a deep question. It, it's, it's really the question of, because these particles are the quantum manifestation of space and time, uh, according to Einstein, it's really the question of what does space and time look like when you look on really small scales? Mm -hmm. For example, is it continuous? Uh, can you move continuously through time and through space? Um, very possibly not. Uh, right, so, that's amazing. Yeah, wow. well, yeah, I always think with these oh. things, it'd be lovely for someone like Carol to you bring, to bring him into the modern age and hear that's what that some of the big questions are. I guess you can do that with historical figures. It would yeah. be uh, sorry, Kate. Were you going to say something? Oh no, it just it was just um, um, yeah, kind of mind blowing. But I was also thinking of the uh, mo well, the, obviously the moment moment in the book of the sort of the, the gravity of falling from one world to another from one universe to another but also I think the the sense of the the description in the text when Alice goes through the looking glass and the looking glass mm -hmm. kind of dissolves to become this haze this sort of fog that mm -hmm. you can then walk such a kind of bonkers idea but actually is quite quite quantum quite part quite particle driven isn't it that yeah, sense it, it, it sort of dissolves and in a sense, that's right. That's right. And and maybe space and time, in some sense, dissolve when you try and look at them on small enough scales. I mean, it's yes, absolutely. It's, it's wonderful. We had a question here from, uh, from Beth. Uh, I wonder if I could put this to you, Kate. It was kind of, I think, if I'm understanding her uh, question right, it's looking at sort of a bit of the societal uh, uh, world, uh, science in society or sort of academia in society around Carol's time, I guess. He, she asks if, she says Carol's imaginary worlds were very diverse, but was there much awareness of uh, the structural op oppression um, uh, and barriers to creating knowledge in the sciences and maths at the time? Was 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 Carol sort of I don't know social up, up for sort of social change or see or see or the sort of person who might challenge social hierarchies that made academia yeah. and science well, and maths quite rigid at the time? Um, 
I think one of the the, uh, the areas where he most definitely was um, sort of pushing for reform was was it was, it was education and actually women's education because um, uh, you know thinking about science separately, but actually the fact that this story was a, a young girl gr growing up in Christchurch. We know she was a, a real little girl who at that time she had a governess. She could probably have done French and music and art, but she she wouldn't have been able to study. Um, maths or all the sciences um but he did champion uh, sort of women's education and study um and i guess in some ways the the books them, themselves are quite open um which is why they've been interpreted in in so many different ways and in so many different languages and still kind of um you know in terms of the sort of looking at how the structures and the hierarchies in the book kind of be, can be adapted and related to different societies and things i think there's an openness to them which is sort of in in, in contradiction perhaps to a world which is the sort of perceived the victorian world that's quite interesting um but i um i think uh yeah i think there's um the, the, and also the sense of the, the the mapping of the world and the explore, exploring of the world, but actually Wonderland is never really mapped or defined, so it has this opportunity for you still to kind of go to go back to it. Um, but one of the things we do know about Lewis Carroll is that he he um, he did, you know. Uh, work, he didn't work in isolation. You know, he, he was friends with Darwin, with Faraday, and 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 with the artists and the thinkers and the politicians. So there was a a, a sort of very rich world that he kind of um, drew from. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, I, well, I certainly answered the question. Yeah. My interpretation of Beth's question. Hopefully, yeah. I've, I've accurately interpreted her question correctly. Uh, I'm sure she'll let us know if if we didn't. Uh, I also had a, a question from Emma, which uh, I'll put to you, Toby. She asked, "Could Alice falling through the rabbit hole to Wonderland be seen as going through a wormhole to an alternative universe?" I guess that's on your personal reflection of reading the book. But the particular thing which you might be able to answer more specifically is: Did our current ideas of alternative universes come before or after? after uh, Alice in Wonderland, the publication of, uh, of Alice in Wonderland, or before or after Lewis Carroll's time? Um, that's, that's an interesting, as far as I'm aware, um, the idea of alternative universes is, is relatively modern. So there are different, um, it depends exactly what one means by alternative universes. So um, there is a sort of um, an idea of parallel universes because of quantum measurement. So when things in quantum mechanics get measured, they get forced into a particular state. And there's a so-called many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics um, dating back quite a long time now, many decades, but not, 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 I mean, this, this is obviously post quantum mechanics, which was really the 1920s. So um, the many world interpretations sort of suggests that all, all possibilities are out there and we perceive ourselves to be in a particular sequence of uh, options that have that have occurred, but really they all exist concurrently. But there's also another um, sort of cosmological interpretation of alternative universes, which is that the structure of the space and time we inhabit is really such that there are lots of different universes, all in the past connected to each other, to so maybe some more primordial object, space-time, but now distinct from each other. And we can't necessarily see what's going on in other universes because they're causally disconnected from each other. Um, and so they're two quite different uh, ideas of alternate universes. Um, I think there are even others which we, I won't explore. But, um, but all of that, to my knowledge, came after. I don't know of um, of sort of discussions. But but that said, I mean, it's very difficult to have a new idea. So those two ideas are in the context of firstly quantum mechanics, and then the latter one, um, Einstein's theory of uh, space and time and gravity. So they're within those frameworks. But of course, people had explored ideas like black holes before Einstein wrote down. Um, his theory of space and time and subsequently our understanding of black holes, but they'd understood it in the sort of context of Newton, not quite right, but they'd thought about these ideas. So it could well be that people, uh, you know, had thought about ideas of alternative universes uh, in some other context very early on. I mean, I'd, I'd be surprised if the Greeks hadn't thought about it, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I always tell my kids is that um, people are no cleverer now than they used to be. Uh, they, they were just as clever. They just they just knew less. 
uh, but they were tremendously clever in the past and would have if you could think about it they would have thought about it yeah. okay. um and we had a, a question from uh, masami for you for you kate which was a. Uh, uh, they uh, Masami heard that, that that Mr. Dodgson told the story to a girl on a, on the, on their picnic day, uh, and they wonder uh, Masami wondered whether there was whether it was quite a simple story maybe at first, and then the the logic and maths and science was sort of added on later on. Do we know the sort of development of the of yeah. the story? Was it this sort of like conceptual huge juggernaut thing right from the offset, or was it a simple story that that, that and then he used that simple story to explore some of his favorite sort of maths and logical uh, elements um, later on? I think what, what we do know, um, and there certainly is a sort of mythology around this golden afternoon in which the story was first told to Alice and her sisters on a rowing boat in Oxford. And, and you know, that, that we don't, we obviously, we don't know what was said on, on that boat. However, um, what we do know is that Alice was this very curious little girl who um, was very keen to kind of ask lots of questions and very bold and um, very adventurous. And she demanded that the story be written up um, so that the, the first um, uh, written version, the manuscript, uh, by Lewis Carroll was given to Alice Little and many of the ideas and much of the text in that first version which is handwritten um, uh, does does include these ideas. Um, it, it did evolve um, before it was published by Macmillan in 1865 but I think what was fascinating Lewis Carroll was he was very interested in um, teaching and learning and curiosity and trying to explain some of those ideas to answers to Alice's big questions in a fun way. So I think that the maths and science was all, always there. Um, and, and you can see from the way that he, he, he tries to sort of bring that into the kind of dialogue because he said you know this book is pictures and conversations so it's it's that sense of um the characters the animal characters within the book were are often described as sort of the dons of oxford so that whether it's the mad hatter or the or the um the mock turtle that they're all trying to kind of share their knowledge so i think that um yes it evolved but yes it it's but the roots of the maths and the science were in there from the beginning i believe Great, thank you. Um, I want to talk about uh, sort of the the corridor sequence. It may, it's something that maybe from the sort of the, the cartoon, uh, rather than necessarily from reading the book, sort of stayed with me. This uh, maybe because of maybe a sense of claustrophobia I had as a child. That the idea that she, as she walks down, it gets smaller. I think it's sort of like yeah, sort of horrified me in a, in a way, but it stuck with me anyway. Uh, and this idea of the sort of shape of time or the shape of space and space and time sort of warping and bending so uh, in a way which is felt very sort of uh, off-putting or very uncomfortable when I watched it as a child but th there's there's uh, there's um, similarities in that or there's elements of that in some of the physics that you look at Toby with around black holes around the sort of this idea that space itself can warp it's not ju not just the things inside it I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that sure well Black holes are the sort of, um, you know, the, the thing that people have heard, you know, know about most where space and time get sort of really distorted and bent to the point where space and time almost breaks uh, inside a black hole. And um, but what Einstein, the brilliance of Einstein was really in saying that, you know, Newton was wrong. Newton said, well, space and time are just this fixed, absolute stage on which everything happens, everything moves within this sort of fixed theater, if you like, of space and time. And Einstein, after special relativity in 1915, wrote down his theory of general relativity, which said actually completely opposite, that space and time isn't fixed at all. It can move and is dynamical, just in the same way as, uh, for example, the electromagnetic field is can, can change and is dynamical. So the electromagnetic field changes in response to uh, electric currents or magnets, um, but the uh, space-time field, if you like, changes and bends in response to mass. And what Einstein realized is that change and bending of space and time, because of matter within it, actually is what gives rise to the force of gravity. So he completely reinterpreted Newton's idea of a force of gravity 
and said, well, there's no force of gravity at all. What happens is you have a mass like the Earth. It bends space and time round it, not to the point where you can see it with your eyes, but to the point where if you try and move in a straight line through space and time, just like Newton told you, if, if, no, if no force acts on you, you move in a straight line, Einstein said, well, that's true. But there's no force of gravity acting on you. You're moving in a straight line, but in this curved space and time. And the result of that is it looks like that straight line looks like an orbit. And so the Earth orbits the sun, for example, because it's moving in a straight line, but in this warped space. And so there's this remarkable uh, reint reinterpretation. And in fact, it's, it's not just a reinterpretation. It's a correction because Newton in detail is wrong. And Einstein in detail is, is as far as we know, completely right. Um, so really, there are deviations from uh, Newton's law of gravity, if you look in detail at objects, even in our solar system, and Einstein predicted those. Um, but um, what, you know, the consequence of that is that space and time are dynamic, and that's, that's a remarkable idea. And also the way we experience time, for example, uh, is not, uh, you know, fixed and absolute different different observers don't agree on the time elapsed between two events. So I, I think, you know, obviously the ideas of scale and changing and, and so on in, in Alice in Wonderland are, are, are fascinating and bizarre mm. and wonderful to read, but the reality is far more crazy. I mean, mm. people, I think, don't realize that time travel is real. So, for example, if the three of us met at South Kensington's tube station and synchronized our clocks, uh, very accurate clocks all together, at the, you know, very carefully, and then walked to the exhibit, the uh, the wonderful Alice exhibit, um, and took different routes, walked in different ways, but all met up again and then looked at our watches. If they were very accurate watches, we would see that they hadn't recorded the same amount of time to have elapsed. And wow. one of us would have traveled into the future of the others in some sense and one of them in you know relatively into the past yeah. and this is um you if you want to read about this you can look up the twins paradox so the twins paradox is the sort of classic statement of this that if i have a if i have a twin um and we're both on earth and then my twin gets into a space rocket uh, and whizzes off very far away near the speed of light for a while and then comes back um i will have aged more and they depending on how fast they went and how far they went, could have aged hardly at all. And um, I mean, it's called a paradox, uh, but the that's a misnomer because it's a real thing. It's just true. Uh, space and time are very tricky. Uh, I mean, they're very different to how we perceive them or how we generate, you know, and, and this is mathematical fact. It really happens. So uh, we're yeah. all time traveling all the time. Yeah, so I hope that doesn't worry you, James. <laughs> In the, in the story, it's so fascinating as well, isn't it? Because the concept of time exists mm. in many different um, yeah. places in the in the book. So obviously, the the rabbit has his uh, pocket watch, and then when we get to the tea party, time is always six p.m. Tea. It's always six p.m. and always having tea. There's and then there's the, the famous quote that is, "If you knew time as well as I do," exactly. <laughs> so like the idea of time being a person. But then when we get to um, uh, Looking Glass as well, those the quotes about jam tomorrow, jam yesterday, but never jam today. So that sense of, um, you know, sort of play, playing with ideas of time and the future. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So all, these ideas, of course, came in 1915 with Einstein. Mm. Um, so it was, you know, a while after. So mm. I, I don't think uh, Dodgson no. would have been thinking in those terms. And it and they really were radical at the time. I mean, it's not it's not that those ideas were sort of existing and Einstein just put them together. Uh, in 1915, when he came up with general relativity, it was way ahead of its time. I mean, it was re really the most unbelievably remarkable sort of feat of thought. Um, but at the same time, like Dodgson, he had to be completely open-minded as to what the nature of these objects, space and time were. And just like Dodgson explored uh, how our perception could mismatch with the reality of space and time or, or different realities of space and time. It's the same process, I suppose, that Einstein was going through in having to fundamentally rethink how this, this notion that we just took for granted for hundreds of years, I say we, but people had, uh, you know, had to be completely rethought. And, and he was right. I mean, it's true. You know, we now can measure all these effects. And 
I think there was a question I saw in the chat, something about whether these ideas are, are, are used in technology. So of course, the ideas of space and time warping and bending in, in Dodgson, they were not um, based on a physical theory at that point. That was a sort of a, sort of a meta, metaphysical exploration, if you like. But from Einstein on, um, they, the ideas of um, how our uh, relativity, how the speed of light is absolute, one of the implications of that, uh, everyone agrees on the speed of light, means that people can't agree on what is time and space. Um, the twins paradox all comes out of special relativity. And in particular, equals mc squared is another consequence. And equals mc squared is where, uh, you know, incredible implications associated to nuclear physics, atomic power, and so on, come from. And that's had probably one of the biggest impacts in societally in various ways, uh, as we all know. And then even his general theory of relativity, the bending of space and time by matter, uh, is of relevance now in the technology of the GPS satellite system. So next time you look on your phone to find out whether you, you know how to get from South Kensington Station to the <laughs> wonderful exhibit in the VNA on Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> which you should all go and see, um, when you're using your phone to figure out where on earth you are, you're triangulating your position from satellites in the sky, and those satellites allow you to triangulate the position by having very accurate atomic clocks on and sending out signals at very accurately timed uh, 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 time uh, sort of intervals. And because they're all moving differently in space at different speeds, like the twins, their clocks are ticking differently relative to each other. In fact, because they're at different heights above the Earth, the space and time is bent slightly differently. And so again, they, the clocks tick differently. And it's a real physical effect that is actually of relevance for the GPS uh, satellite system and, and i think as we go as we develop more in space technology which is clearly something that's happening now these issues will become more and more uh of technological uh use i mean it, the mind boggles but i mean it's mm. yeah it's, it's really exciting okay as we sort of draw to an end of this i, I, I want just to come it was something that toby mentioned about sort of the, maybe a, a shared uh mindset maybe between someone like einstein and someone like dobson this idea of not not accepting uh sort of reality in the way that it seems obvious that it is to us in terms of our perceptions and and, and also trying to show a truth trying trying to show a truth about reality beyond that but beyond the everyday or beyond what we can see i i felt that one part of the exhibition that i sort of saw that was in something a completely different art form away from writing in, in terms of his photography and the use of exposure and distortion techniques i mean it's quite it's quite, I think it's quite accepted or common now that people think photography can show a reality beyond what we could see. A good photographer can show something. But his, he was experimenting with photography as an art form to sort of, I felt there was trying to show yeah. you know, emotion or capture a moment in a way which isn't, is more than just what was there in the actual picture. Yeah, it's really important to kind of um, to, 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 to address that because he was a pioneering photographer and uh, there's a wonderful image in the exhibition um, where he is capturing that moment in time but with a double exposure. So there's a, there's a sense of um, something feeling like it's real and, and, and not real. Um, and at the same time, we, we know that, you know, Alice is... Um, Sort of looking at a dream and the kind of the sort of subconscious so there's a there's a sort of sense of catching a moment but also what's real and what's imaginary and I think through the the, the sort of his um exploration in photography he was obviously using the kind of technological advancements of the time to play around with some of these I ideas um but also you can then relate that to the book through the fact that um this sort of sense of the the, the real and the imaginary and 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 um yeah I think I think uh his sort of polymath the fact that he was interested in all of these things at the same time so it was so sort of for formative and so um found within the books yeah I think that definitely that definitely comes mm -hmm. through throughout the exhibition yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um I think we're we're just about at the end now so uh I, I just wanted to yes yeah, so unfortunately that does bring us to the end of this discussion. Uh, I just want to thank you so much, Kate and Toby, for joining us today. Uh, Kate, uh, how long is the exhibition on for, for people who, who want to go see it? Do you know the details? The exhibition's, like 
Yeah, the exhibition's on um, until the end of December before it goes on a world tour, which is exciting. Um, so, so do come. We do have some other events coming up. Um, we're, we're doing um, some events on the on the Looking Glass um, anniversary. So, the anniversary of the Looking Glass is this year. It's 150 years since the book. Uh, so, we're on the weekend of the fifth to the sixth, seventh of November. There'll be some activities at the, at the museum, um, looking again at some of those themes and ideas within the text and celebrating that. But um, yeah, one thing I would say actually is that if you step into the V&A garden, which you can come to any point and it's free and when the exhibition isn't on, there's a doorway and uh, at the back of the, the back behind the pond and above this doorway, it says, um, better to have wisdom than gold. And there are three scientists and three artists, um, Newton, Davy, and Watt, and Michelangelo, Titian and Bramante. So this sense of the sort of science and art coming together with this sort of sense of wisdom really feels like it chimes with the book. So plug for the v yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, and, uh, that is very much in keeping with what we're trying to do with the Great Exhibition Road Festival and things that interest us. So yeah, um, thank you so much to both of you for being able to sort of help us tell this story and give it a sort of a modern scientific in, interpretation or give it a context around it in terms of modern physics and maths. So yeah, thank you so much, Toby, for joining us. I hope, uh, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you got a chance. I'm yeah, glad your children you. enjoyed the book. I'm glad you had a chance to sort of reread it or revisit it recently. Um, for those, uh, if, for the, you guys watching on YouTube, uh, apologies if we didn't get to your questions or read out your thoughts. Uh, there will be a recording of this discussion that will go up on the sort of Great Exhibition Road Festival YouTube channel. And that's where all future events uh, that we put on will be. So please do click on the subscribe button and you'll get a little notification when your new event uh, happens. Uh, we're just about to post an evaluation link uh, in the chat. So if you could um, take a minute to fill that in, uh, that it won't take more than five minutes. Uh, that would really help us. It helps us sort of come up with new ideas for events and 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 sort of improve the events we we do deliver uh so yeah thanks thanks so much again to all our audience for all your questions uh, otherwise i think that's about it from me uh so I'm, it just leaves me to sort of wish you all a, a farewell uh the festival is returning in person in october on the october the 9th and 10th in south kensington so do visit our website and you can sign up then and uh, and come to some talks and some uh, and some workshops uh, so hopefully i might see some of you then but otherwise uh, have a great afternoon have a great friday afternoon have a great weekend everyone uh, yeah thank you very much from the great exhibition road festival cheers guys <laughs>